That was just too funny. Welcome to session one of Medallion Mastery. It's finally here. What's a medallion? That's probably question number one. And a medallion typically means that you start with a center something. It could be one block, it could be four blocks, it could probably even be a little small quilt, frankly, that then you built out from. So even though this is a program that we do have a group that is set up that has the pattern and can follow along with us, we want to make this interesting enough that anyone that is just viewing for basic history and information will find it fulfilling as well. So I thought it would be helpful to lay out a few quilts and give you a little bit of info into this and then we'll get started on our program. The one that I have laying on the table is, is an earlier one that I've made and I love this style because this border really is very um, reminiscent of the 17 and 1800s in its width and in its classic style. I simply chose one block, and this happens to be a Lucretia Mott block, and I just framed it out, put a border in, used another border, and then this. So this was a repeating stripe. So I really got a lot of bang for my buck on this. So really pay no attention to necessarily what the block is. I want you to get a, a, a broader picture of what medallions can be and what they typically are. This is a block that I did for Julia Ward Howe, who of course I hope you know wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And it's just one big center block, just like the Lucretia was, with a little bit of work around the outside edge a pieced border, a separator, a little bit of machine embroidery, another border, and a final border. And what makes a style like this so much fun is this isn't like a, a, a big year-long project or anything. I mean, you can just have a block in, your, in the drawer that you didn't use and you can decide to build a medallion around it. And I love the way your half square triangle borders help fill this. I can organize those half squares in a hundred different ways to have a great project. But you notice I have a lot of filler pieces and those filler pieces are really what I call band-aids because I'm telling you folks, if you put filler pieces in between your pieced elements, you really can always stay on grid. And this is really one of my favorite quilts from the earlier collection as well. And this is a block I did for Eleanor Roosevelt and it really just, speaks medallion. Now I did four blocks in the center to start this medallion, then I framed, then I did half squares, then I framed, then I did quarter squares, then I framed, and then I did a little dugout border and another frame. So by doing this kind of thing, I really have a great opportunity to use a variety of fabrics. It can be very scrappy. It can also be very planned. This is just giving you a little taste of what you can expect if you want to make medallion quilts. Let me remind you, for those who are in the program, you have the handouts. For those who are watching just for technique, I'm just gonna talk about general information, how you assemble things. The very first thing I want to do, because our center block in this quilt is made up of some log cabins, and it's made up of some flying geese. I want to talk to you about how to sew your flying geese element. So let's make that little goose first. Now let's take a look at this flying geese unit and because I cut these with rulers, my quarter square and my half squares each have a flat nose and they also each have a point. Had you cut these traditional, you would not have these flat noses, but you would do the identical thing. When I'm sewing flying geese units, I always sew them in this position. So I have my goose flying right, and I have my two half squares flat tops kissing because I cut them as a set. Again, if you had cut traditional, this might not be appropriate for you. And I've got two sets ready to go. I always put the top on first as the goose is flying right. So the bottom one, if I was sewing 50 of these, these bottoms would get put out of the way. I'll pick up my flying geese unit, which is my quarter square triangle. 
my half square triangle is just going to sandwich right on top of that. That's what I'm after right there. Always take the time to line up the bottom edge. And if this is right, I don't worry about this as much as I worry about this. Now I'm, I'm going to simply go into the machine at my quarter inch mark, right on the edge of my foot, take a stitch or two, then I take the time to make sure that this, these are lined up. These sandwich in on top of each other and so beautifully. When I take this out, a lot of times I just cut that off because I've handled it and it's in the right position. And now I'm going to do that, squeeze back, and then when I pick the second one up, my flat top is always in the right position. And you'll see that there will almost always, when you use a ruler, you'll almost always have that little nub and you would not be incorrect. I've got this in, I'm gonna take a stitch to hold things, which lets me deal with this. There's my finished flying geese unit. Quarter inch, clean 90 degree corners. Regardless of the method that you are going to use to cut flying geese, and I don't care what project this is in, this could be something you're making a year from now, but these techniques will serve you well. In this center block that I'm working on now, I use two different sizes of flying geese because I have one size of a flying geese unit that lives in my center star, and then I have fatter <laughs> flying geese that lives in my outer star. And what is so important is really when you look at these things is that it's what are you making? What size is it? So try not to get caught up in K, what size is yours? I want you to see your choices when you're assembling and making these. So right now I have the entire center assembled. Now for those of you who are just wanting technique, we have also released a video that is nothing but how to sew this little fellow right here. So you can find that on the YouTube channel with all of our other videos. And then let's say you just wanted to make a quilt of nothing but that little star. I just showed you how to make a flying geese unit. We're also going to show you how to do that and you'd be ready to roll. But for those in the program who are actually working on their pattern in front of them from their little notebook, let's say I laid this out and it looked like this and I'm like, Ooh, I really like that. I just got to have some corners, but I like that block. Here's what I want you to know. That when you make these elements, look what would, and I had to make two more. Y'all feel sorry for me. I, I don't, I know nobody feels sorry for me, but see how much fun that would be. And I, in class lots of times in making a star, I would have a student that would actually sew those in this order and then thought that they were making it wrong that's not true. This is in itself a block. So look how fun that would be. I don't have to have the star points in a specific manner, but I just have to know what my direction is. And honestly, there are times that I get to this point and then go, well, heck, I like that better than I liked what I planned. So now I'm going to turn my points back around the way they go just to show you some choices. My log cabin blocks in this orientation are merely replacing what would be a big square or a half square or whatever you wanted them to be. In the quilt behind me, I have them going this way. Well, when I got these all finished, look at the difference. In, and, and again, this is just food for thought. I like it better this way. And the reason I do is because this ends up creating my outer frame and I think that I'm going to sew this one different. And, and what my suggestion to you would be that when you're designing or working with a project and you think you're going to make a star, don't be, uh, don't be alarmed if the quilt decides it wants something else because I think quite often the fabric that I have used tells me which way I'm going to go. It's not like I don't love the other with these turned this way. 
So if you look at this, you get the opportunity to say, and, and if we were taking a vote, I'm sure that some of you would like one over the other. Since it's my quilt, I get to choose. If it's your quilt, you get to choose. But that is the way that I'm going to assemble this. Whoops. And then I'm going to assemble row one, row two, and row three. And I bet there's somebody out there going, Kay, what on earth would make you put the top and the bottom on first? I'll tell you how I did it. I used a large toile, and the toile is a scenic. I love the scenics for working with in backgrounds. They do create a little bit of a challenge in that you got a person. So let's just say their head's up here and their foot's down here. And pretty soon when you start cutting, you got heads upside down and all of that stuff. And that normally doesn't bother me. But on a large triangle like this one is, I, I fussy cut with a ruler these so that I would get the bodies in the right orientation. And that gives me an opportunity to give you a little tip. For those of you who've worked with me, you know that I love specialty rulers and that when I'm cutting quarter square triangles, I typically will use a ruler. But when I'm making center blocks for medallions like this, and I've got a large element for that quarter square triangle, I would probably recommend you consider doing the traditional calculation which is the long leg of this outside plus one and a quarter. If I've got a square, here's the head, here's the foot, left hand, right hand, or whatever that would be. If I cut it in fours, I have automatically dissected these quarter square triangles for the star. So what's in that top cut's gonna be the top, bottom, left and right. You will never lose the image out of position. When you cut with specialty rulers, if it's large elements like that, you have the likelihood that somebody's gonna have to stand on their head or there's gonna be a dog going on the side. So give some thought to that. And it's a, it gives me another opportunity to tell you that because I love specialty rulers does not mean I don't see the value of traditional work. Traditional math is like basic one, two, three. I think you all will be served well if you know them all then you choose the method at hand that delivers you the best result. And in this case, that's why I did a little extra putzing around. Now, after I make my center block, it's supposed to be a given size. One of the things that I learned a long time ago, supposed to and is, is two different things. So what I'm gonna do, I wanna lay out, and I've only cut two just to show you because I'm not quite ready to put these on anyhow. So I'm gonna lay these out, and they're probably not even the right size, so don't, don't worry about that. One of the decisions that I've got to make on this first border, and for those of you in the program, you have the math on this. What you want to do is know that this has got to have a determined size. If I get to that point, and let's say it was supposed to be 12, and it's 11 or 13, neither one of those are gonna help me. So if it's too small and this border's got to be one set size, I just add that math to this border and then I get it to the size it's supposed to be. Let's say it's too large. I just take off some on that one. So as long as you have filler strips between your elements as you build, you will never get in trouble on this. So when I put my first border on as, the, as we are doing in the program, I just put the two sides on, then the top and bottom on the current one. But on the one I'm working on, I think what I'm gonna do is mix it up and I'm gonna put a cornerstone. So really, let's just use some fake math. Let's just say that this whole thing was 30. And I went, okay, I'm gonna cut 30 for the sides and then I'm gonna have to cut uh, the top and bottom longer. If you put cornerstones in and you're working with a square, all four of your borders would be cut the exact same size. So whatever I was gonna put on the sides, I just cut four of them, and then I would put cornerstones on, which means that I would sew my top and bottom row with two squares on the corner. And what I love about this, especially once I turn these out. Now on the quilt that I'm working on, I turned them in. So it looked like this. But when I decided to put the white, the creamy unit out, I like that cornerstone in there. And what my goal is to those in the program and to those who are just watching for general info, 
There is no rule on this, folks. If you like it one way or the other, that's what you should do because it's your quilt. And then the most important thing is it keeps my quilt from looking like everyone else's quilt. And if I make three of these, I'm likely to change every single one of them just because I can. And one of the beauties and one of the joys of patchwork is the fact that I can. So the only thing that we do in session one is complete this. And obviously my little center star even is sashed so that if that size is not what it's supposed to be, I have an opportunity to repair it. And when I come to this, then I keep building. I don't want you to think that I don't think you are able to sew perfect. What I do know is the more angles and the more pieces you have in something, the more likely you're not spot on. I am a pretty clean sewer, but I just find this gives me a lot of room to get through this without any uh, complications. And I love the fact that my borders can be personal and they can be whatever makes my project work. So now all I've got to do is go to the sewing machine and put these little guys together and I'm going to get that done so that on session two, we're going to get into a little more framing and we're going to talk other pieced borders. Everything that we have talked about today is going to show up in the links below. So we'll see you on the next session. Bye-bye.